now and I wanted to make sure you had today's sermon in case I mess up somebody want to help out here um, but uh, but now you like I said last week now you know everything that I'm going to say so if I don't say it you can go ahead and study it out that happened last week by the way and last week I didn't get done with, with what I wanted to do and, and uh, in doing so I I ended up turning loose of it a little bit early um, <laughs> and come to find out that's a good reason to hand out that hand out those uh, you can take it home and look at it yourself and uh, so anyway we are looking at the at the verses that we just read and uh, looking at what uh, you have seen there uh, in the fact of being in Christ Jesus and um, there is a there is a huge blessing that comes in knowing that we are in Christ and uh, so we want to we, we want to study it we're going to open it up one more time going to have you looking at it uh, together with it with me and we'll see what we can what we can do together let me get everything all set up and going here uh, and uh, so in the third the third uh, sermon in who am I in Christ and what we what we find when we come into this is, is I'm significant okay so these verses all touch base with being uh, significant in our place in Christ you know we we know that we have been given access we know that we are accepted that was the first one and now and then we we talked about being secure in Christ and, uh, and how that uh, because he has taken us in, it's not about whether we can keep ourselves good enough to stay there. God says we are, so we are. And, uh, and the verses that went with that today, today we're going to talk about significance in the body of Christ, to be significant in Christ and what it means. And so when I get to this, um, this set of verses here and look at it, it's in Romans chapter 8. And verse uh, 35 through 39, I'm going to read it in the, in, in the ESV just because you, you've got it in the NLT there. You may want to look at your own Bible, who knows. But anyway, here is, here is what he says in the, in the idea of, uh, of God being uh, in a position to where we are significant in Christ. Picking up the reading in verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all the day long we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered knowing all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to have God's word right here with us, to be able to look at it and to be able to know that we are in Christ once we have accepted you as our Savior, that we are not just left out to, to hope we can get along, but rather that there is a uh, there is a significance in in who we are and that we are uh, yours and that we belong to you and that makes us somebody even when we don't feel like we are somebody when we feel like we are not uh, very uh, don't feel very proud of ourselves Lord we need to look at this and know that you are have given us that position of significance. And it has nothing to do with my activities. Once I am in Christ, I am in Christ. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see here that we are accepted, we are secure, and now we, this is all about the fact that I am significant. Okay, and, and you may say, well, that's kind of, that's kind of easy for, for you to say. I don't always feel significant. I don't always feel like I am on top of the world. And the truth is, is it's just like me whenever, 
whenever you guys chew me out because whenever somebody says, how are you doing? And I say, probably better than I deserve. I have several of you that remind me that in Christ I deserve it. And therefore, I'm, it doesn't matter what I feel. Well, that's kind of the way it is with being significant. And that is, is that significance does not come from your achievements. It comes from God's achievements through you. And so I'm not one of these that stands up here and pumps you full of hot air and, and hope uh, a preacher that, that just says uh, that everything's going to go rosy and merry and, che and cheery in your lives. I'm here to say that even when it doesn't, you are loved by a God who says that he holds his love, his arms of love out from un underneath you and lifts you up. It's not, it's again, it's not about us. It's about him. And so when we look at this, let's, let's start out. First of all, how are we significant? Well, we are the salt and the light in the world of darkness around us. That means, that means in a sense that, we, are, uh, un, that we, are, we have an impact even when it doesn't feel like we have an impact. Whenever we look at Matthew 5, 13 and 14, he says, you're the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its savor? Can you make it salty again? It should be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You know, we in this country know what that means more than anything. Because used to, when I was a little kid, I used to think, instead of asking, are we there yet? I'd look up and see if I could see any, any lights on the horizon because it might be 10 miles away still, but I, I knew we was getting close because the light that is out there, you know, I, there's no way I can 50 miles away from tubing carry and yet I can step out on our back, in our backyard at night and I can see the glow of the lights from tubing carry. Well, you know, that and a lot of people don't have that ability. Most people, matter of fact, Becky had a, a sister-in-law that, one time told us she didn't like to come to Colorado because you could see too far. Well, she would have a panicked wreck if she had, if, if she had, if she had seen this. Because it is, you know, when I, I used to tell people, I said, I can stand on top of the garage and see the school 25 miles away. <laughs> that's, a, that's, about the, that's about the flattest that I thought I ever found until I went to Perryton, Texas. And uh, and Perryton's flatter than that, and they they <laughs> they make us look like a hill country. But the thing is, is being salt and light, we have an obligation. Then, if we are salt and light in a in in a world around us, then we have a need to be a light shining in the darkness. How many times do we get an opportunity to shine light into someone else's life? Too many times somebody, somebody comes against us, somebody does something wrong, or somebody cuts us off in traffic, and we are far from being the light in a dark world. We're more likely to be an, a, a, an excellent example of what not to do rather than what to do. Well, that's shame on us. We Christians have a need to be that light. We have a need also to be salt, which, by the way, is... A, is, is a preservative. It is, it is a curing, uh, uh, something that cures. It preserves. It is, a, it, is a, uh, uh, it is that which brings taste into the world around us, that we are that in a bland world. So you need to let your light shine. You need to let the salt of who you are flavor the world around you. Too many times it flavors us. We need to be the one who carries it to the world. You know what that means? It means when somebody hates you, you need to pray for them. When somebody says things bad about you and your family, you need to, you need to, you need to get in the habit of, of just stopping and praying for them. Whenever someone does you wrong, well, God will get the end word. Don't worry. You don't have to. Okay? It's awfully hard for us to keep our hands out of it. But the thing that we need to see is, is that God is in control. If we're going to believe we're in Him, then we are in control, but only as long as we stay within Christ, within that. Okay, so when I look at this and I see the branches of the true vine, I am a branch of the true vine. I am a channel of life. That means God 
has a need for you to keep your, number one, your feeling with, the, with God to, to allow the sap to come up in your branches. If we're going to talk about the root being God and the branches all coming up, the, the main stalk of the, of the, of the vine uh, being Christ, then we are the branches. And what happens to branches if the Holy Spirit of God, the, the sap, if you will, flows up unhindered through our branches, uh, we will bear fruit. We will bear fruit. It's not a we might. As long as nothing constricts that. Now we had a, we had a, this is a kind of an off, offside note uh, example, but we had a wisteria plant that mom had planted years and years and years and years ago. And one main branch was dying completely. It had withered up and it, I had to go in and literally cut that one out because what had happened is she had, she had planted uh, or had dad drive two stakes in the ground made out of metal to hold the, 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 the to give it something to lean on. And in actuality, the way that those things are, it wrapped around it and went between those two and actually pinched itself off to where the whole plant was about to die. And so I always think of that and think, you know, if we allow the Holy Spirit because of our actions to be uh, uh, pinched off in our lives, we're going to be good, good for nothing. We're, we're not going to be good for anybody. We have to open that up through allowing God to flow through our lives and, be, and, and, and allow that Holy Spirit to flow through us. We can never bear fruit if we don't let the vine have its course within us. Uh, you know, when we, when we look at that, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vineyard keeper, the husbandman. In, in 15, 5, in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. You see, we have to have that fruit in our lives. We have to have that, um, that sap flowing easily up into us. And then we will bear the fruit that God wants us to bear fruit on. You know, when, we, when we have been chosen... I have been chosen and appointed to bear that fruit. And, and, and again, 15, 16 says, you shall not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatsoever you ask in the Father's name, I will give it. You know, if, if you think for one minute you can bear fruit of yourself and your power, you're nuts. Because the Satan will trample that faster than anything. You have to realize you have been chosen to bear fruit by God. And therefore, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come and to, and to flow through you. In the, in, 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 the, in the next step, it says, I am a personal witness for Christ. Every one of us witnesses one way or another. You are either a witness pointing them to Christ or you are a witness telling them that he's a liar and it's not true. You've got to watch, Christian, how your life lives. If your life is such that it demands attention away from God, you're off base. If, it is, if your life it is, the, is the kind of a life that stops people from hearing the gospel, you've got to change. It's a simple word that means that, that says repentance. We have to live a life of repentance. We have to look at our lives and we have to say about the time that we want to say what we want to say, that I will catch that and say that will do no good and turn away from that and turn to Christ and, and, and realizing that in Christ, we are the ones who are, who are bearing fruit because of God, not because of us. So the sap has to keep going. The sap has to be able to, 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 be, uh, to flow through us. But then once it flows through us, there will be uh, a, 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 a fruit that comes. And so that is my personal witness for Christ. You say, well, I'm, never, I, I'm not a preacher. 
<laughs> okay, let's talk about something here for a minute. If you follow what he says in these words, then you have to realize you are a witness, true? Okay, You're not, he's not, I hope I can. You are, okay? So the next step is to realize then that whenever we uh, do things and say things, you're no different than the preacher. The preacher just gets up here and spouts off, but you are the ones who actually are boots on the ground in the area where God has put you, and you can do a whole lot more than I can. We're all on equal ground when it comes to being here. The only reason I'm a pastor up here is because you guys let me. I tell people that. You've probably heard me say that to, to visitors. They let me be the pastor here. Still astounds me. Okay? You guys, you guys are just as important in the in the in the body of Christ as I am. It's no different. There's no difference. So your witness, all you have to do is just this. It's just this simple. Just tell them. Tell them what you know. Tell them what happened with you. That's what a witness does. He doesn't tell what, the, what actually happened in, the, in a wreck. He looks at the wreck and he say, the police ask him, what did you see? And you say, well, I saw this. And somebody else may say, well, I saw something different. It doesn't matter. You're all witnesses to the same account. You're witnesses to Christ. So you just tell them what happened to you, okay? So there we go on that. Now then, we're going to shift gears just a little. You are the, and the word is nous. I don't know if I'm saying it right or not. It, you are the only time this particular word for temple is used in Scripture is for the Holy of Holies. You are God's temple. He says there in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are the temple, God's temple, and Holy Spirit dwells in you? The Holy of Holies. You are God's Holy of Holies. I don't know about you, but that just, that just really hits me hard. That he would pick the one word... I would think, okay, I'm the temple, and I'd think of the, I'd think of, you know, the fact that the the church is a, is a temple of a sorts, and the, and all. And no, he's not saying that. He's saying you are together, the holy of holies, the innermost sanctuary of the temple, and that there is where the mercy seat is there is where the blood of jesus christ comes in and is sprinkled on the on the mercy seat of god on the ark of the covenant and you say well how do i how do i fit as the holy of holies god has chosen you as a chosen vessel to carry the gospel of jesus christ you talk about significance wait Talk about, the, talk about the, the creation. Do I believe in creation? Absolutely. Word for word. Scripture, Genesis 1, Genesis 2. It's all there. You, if it says it, I believe it. I don't care whether, you know, it's, it's, it's not I, I, I believe it, therefore it is. It's, it's, it's there, so therefore I believe it, okay? So the, so the bottom line on the being this is that you were created and chosen by God to carry and be a repository for the mercy seat of God. How do you do that? By reconciling people to God, which we're going to talk about in a minute, bringing them to God and giving them an ability to see Christ because of your witness, okay? So you are the Holy of Holies. The next one is, I am a minister of reconciliation. I am, the, the word reconciliation simply means to restore people to favor with God or for God. God is doing it through you. You are doing it to the people so that they can also have reconciliation in God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, rather lengthy, but just bear with me. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have, become, have come. Now everything is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is Christ. He, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to you. I'm going to say, change the word from us to you. It needs to be point on that you are the one that is carrying this. You are commit to you. It's committed the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Certain that God is appealing through us. We plea on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Right there is everything you need to take to them. Right there is every little word that you need to speak to someone. You have been chosen as an ambassador of reconciliation to reach out to people as, and, and you say, but I, my life ain't good enough. I don't, I, nobody will listen to me. Don't, don't give me the excuses. Just know this. God will use you right where you are, not where you might be someday. He will use you right now to carry this message of reconciliation to everyone around you. You say, but that's the preacher's job. <laughs> no, it ain't. It's not the preacher's job. It's all of us' job. It's the church's job. Okay? So reconciling the lost to God through Jesus Christ means simply this. Help others restore their relationship with the Lord, a relationship that was severed by their sin. You see, they once were created in fellowship with God, but sin came into the world. Sin severed that relationship, and all you're doing is offering them a way out to go back to that position that you had. They have forgiveness through Jesus. They are reconciled, restored to good favor with, with God. So, in essence, you are a co-worker with God. You are a co-worker, just like it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. <laughs> okay. Now, that, see, I don't even have to preach. All I got to do is read Paul's writings. Okay. He's saying it would be wrong of you to have this gift given to you and then you to keep your mouth shut and ignore the people who there, again, I'm going to take you back to the idea that this is all like a big sphere and you're in there and God's going to bring inside that sphere the ones he wants you to deal with that day. If you see it that way, then anybody you comes into contact with is obviously someone who needs a spirit of reconciliation brought to them and you're just the one who can do it, bringing them back to God. You say, what if, I, what, what if they ignore me? Then they're not ignoring you, they're ignoring God. What if they make fun of me? Then they're not making fun of you, they're making fun of God. Well, that makes me mad. Well, you got the same boots to get happy in as you did to get mad in, so just get used to it. We will always be hated if we live our Christian life correctly. We will always be rejected and laughed at by the world because they rejected Christ. They mocked him. Are you better than him? No. Nope. So when we get to studying this back together again and get to looking at it again, we see that there is a, there is a message for us. So we are to be God's workers and you are in God's field as God's worker and you are to do God's bidding while you're there. So, if you, if you hire a hired hand, and you tell him, now here's the way I work cows. We do this, we do this, we do this. They understand it, and then they go off and do their own thing. There's going to be a coming to, coming to understanding here that, there is going, that we're going to change things because the way we work cows is like this. It doesn't matter what you do. So in this case, what you're doing is you are in God's field, you are in God's employ, you are God's workman, and therefore you do it God's way. <laughs> Ross, when you got, got out there to start plowing, did, did you go back in your mind and say, now how would dad have done this? What did he say? We'd, how, how would we do this? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just natural for all of us. We want to do whatever we were told to do. You don't, you don't go off and do it your own way and then hope for forgiveness. You do it God's way, okay? So if I am God's worker, then what about the fact that I'm also God's workmanship? So Ephesians 2.10, and by the way, these all point to your significance. God trusts you to carry the gospel the only way you know how. God trusts you to tell somebody that God loved me enough to save me and he'll love you too. You, you come to this and you say, I'm going to do it and work in tandem with God. And we come into the fact that we are God's workmanship. If you want to put it this way, this Bible verse says you are his masterpiece. He says, Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do, so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Do you realize that God loved you before you ever knew him? Do you, you know that God created you with a specific task in mind? That God would love you enough to not only know you by name and know what your limitations would be and know what your strengths would be and, and he would, upon salvation, then gift you with what he wanted you to have and so many people sit around and say, I can't. Moses being one of them. I can't talk, Lord. I can't talk. I can't. I was surprised the Lord didn't slap him upside the head. God said he could speak. Why didn't he just shut up and speak? That's the way, that was the way I always, always looked at it. I'm not judging him. I'm saying me too. When it, how many times is it that I, God says this person needs a little, a little encouragement from the Lord and you just sit there? Whether you're mad at them and you don't want to give it to them, how selfish would that be? Or whenever you are in, whenever you're, Sitting there and, and, and you think, oh, no, that's just me thinking. No, 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 no. God is going to use you. You are his masterpiece. You are his workmanship. He created you in Christ Jesus through your salvation to do the good things that he'd already had planned for you. That's what it says. When you naturally find something that, 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 that is seemingly easy for you, and other people standing around with their thumbs in their back pockets going, I don't know, I, I don't know how to do that. That's because God may have put you in that position right then and there to do the only thing you can do right then and there. Joe Blow, it's not his job because he didn't send him here. I may approach God, here's another one, with freedom and confidence. Man, I can't imagine trying to do God's work in my power. I have experienced it a few times, and let me tell you, it never ends well. Whenever I think for one minute that I can do this, boy, forget it. That, that old song, I did it my way, you better hope you don't get there and hear that song played in heaven when you're being judged. It ain't for you to do it your way. It's for you to do it God's way, through God's power, with God's people in mind. Wanting to reconcile the lost. Having a burden for those who can't do for themselves. That's the whole reason why we had VBS, folks. We had VBS so that because the, the kids get to hear the gospel, yes, the teachers get to teach. And by the way, that's just as important for them as it is for the kids. <laughs> Didn't it? <laughs> it's just as important for you to be able to serve in the manner you served and hopefully in the background so that nobody else saw it. I know good and well that there were things done that, that, that weren't anybody saying, you go do this for me. Rather, they just said, oh, I need to do this. Lawns mowed, trash picked up, things that can be done easily. Walking by a piece of paper on the floor and saying, that's not somebody else's job to pick that up. It's mine. Too many times we want to say, but I didn't put it there. It doesn't matter whether you put it there or not. Pick it up. Put it in the trash yourself. 
You walk over there and the coffee pot ain't, ain't making, make coffee. Somebody will drink it. So when we think about all of this, we can approach God with confidence. He says in, he says in 3.12, Ephesians 3.12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into, Christ, into God's presence. <laughs> How good is that? You have the, not, not the, you can't, you're not going to come in there with your head down. Boldly and confidently come storming into the throne room of God and tell him what you need. He wants you to. And I'm going to give you a little bit more. You say, but I did once and it didn't happen. Listen, God says, do it again and again and again, until you feel like you're infringing on God's patience, and then do it again. That's what he said. Luke 18. So whenever we get there, we got to realize we can boldly come into the throne room of God and expect God to give us an answer. It may not always be yes, because we don't know the whole story. That's, what, that's what's hard whenever it's Brother Walter. That's what's hard whenever it's Francis. That's, what, that's when it's hard whenever we, we see this young girl hurt in a, in a, in a rodeo arena and, and we're praying for her to, to, to the swelling to stay down in her brain so that she's not either doesn't wake up or has major head problems when she wakes up. It's not, it's, it, we don't get to make that call. We don't know the whole story. We're sitting back here looking and saying, I want this. Well, yeah, good. Ask him. But if the answer is no, then just keep trudging forward. Keep doing the next thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You talk about significance. You are capable in God's will to do what you need to do. Heard a preacher this morning say, matter of fact, my old, my old preacher, he, he said this morning on, on his preaching time, he said, he said, you have to understand that when you ask, you ask in God's will and you must go to God's word to find God's will and when Go and uh, submerge yourself into the Word of God and you start seeking and finding what He has for you that whenever you, whenever you get it, you're going to understand that God gave it to you. You don't have the strength to fight this battle. God does. But God said He would gift you with the strength to do it. I don't think there's any way to misunderstand that verse. I can do everything through Christ. He gives me strength. And then I'm going to finish on the same one we kind of started with. We are seated at the right hand of God right now. Now, you, a lot of people always tell me, I don't get that. I don't get that. Okay, here, it's just, I'll give it to you one more time. We're three parts. This body that you see, Sorry about that, but that's the only thing I've got to show you, okay? The one God gave me. This one, this body, what you see, if you were to take and put me in a, a position to where I couldn't move anything in my body, you could look in my eyes and know that you're still talking to Joe, right? I mean, you, you, it, that's, that's still there, okay? Matter of fact... It's your opportunity to do all the talking if I can't move, okay? So whenever, whenever we get to, the, the, get to that, we say, okay, so it's not about the body. Then we got to look at the soul. And the soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, everything that is exhibited whenever the body can't handle it. That's what, that's, you're seeing that when they're talking to you and telling you things. That's their mind. That's their will. That's their emotion. The third part of you, that, by the way, we're going to work on that until Jesus comes. We're not ever going to get it completely worked out. Right, guys? <laughs> 
They're still working on me. I don't know if he's still working on you or not, but he's still working on me. So what's next? The Spirit. And here's where this is right here. You are seated in the Spirit that you have in Christ is already seated at the right hand of God because you are secure. Remember last week? And because you're secure, then you can simply say, I am saved. You can say, I am being saved, my mind, will, and emotions, and my body will one of these days completely be saved at the rapture of Jesus Christ. He's going to come and take you home. He's going to give you a new body. Ooh, praise God, we're going to all be heavy and beautiful. And when you say heavy, what do you mean heavy? Because I'm, I'm convinced that we're all supposed to look like this. And you guys are... You guys are just off base a little bit, okay? <laughs> Those of us that are a little heavy, maybe we're living right, okay? I've been told all my life, you're not living right. You, you see how heavy you are? I go, it's what God gave me, okay? So what, do I, what am I saying? It's simply this. If I am seated at the, in, with Christ at the right hand of God, then it goes like this, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, which is what, we, what I read, what we read. God is rich in mercy. And He loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins, originally you were dead and had to be resurrected from that deadness. We, you were dead because of your sins and he gave us life, life eternal. When he raised Christ from the dead. By the way, notice that phrase, do you? When he raised Christ from the dead. You didn't just get saved and be raised to be with him. He said when Christ raised, you were raised. Wow. At the resurrection from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ Jesus. You see, whenever you go through the resurrection the same way Jesus Christ did is because Jesus is God and God is outside of time. And so therefore, when you accepted Christ at that moment that you accepted Christ, your old life died. And you were raised again with Christ in the resurrection. You have already gone there because he's outside of time. He could do it for each one of us at the moment that we accepted Christ. I don't understand that completely because I'm still human. But the truth is, is it's right there for you to see that he raised you with Christ. He seats you with Christ because time don't mean anything. You're already there. He raised you from life into life from the dead at the moment that you accepted Christ. Now the only question is, are you still, are you even at this moment saved and alive in God or are you still dead in your sins? And the only difference between that, the only way to know that is to say, I know that when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior and I put my faith and trust in Him, He saved me, then you're one of the ones that's alive. If I've never had that experience, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you couldn't tell me when you've accepted Christ, that's the reason testimonies are so important. You're telling everybody what they can rejoice over. I hear what. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'll, uh, if, if it broke, I'll buy more. <laughs> we, we just need to know it's beyond you. You were risen with Christ. You were seated at the right hand of God. Therefore, you can, you can rejoice and say, I'm, I don't have to worry about that. I'm already there. What a blessing that is. What a glorious thing that is. So as all of this piles together, it's just this simple. You are significant enough for God to trust you to do what needs to be done, what he wants you to do. He is absolutely 
bringing you to that position of being in front of the person that needs to hear it. So just talk to everybody. You'll find them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the, the, the trust you have in us to be able to, to live our lives the way you want us to, to be able to give us the